Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, so today I just want to give a, a little bit of a discussion about machine learning. So this was actually a request of Bob's. <laughs> we were talking about which topics we should um, present on. And I was like, you know, it'd be good if we had a little bit more information about machine learning. So I actually use machine learning methods during my uh, dissertation work. And so I'll be sharing some of the uh, information I learned, not necessarily from the dissertation, but just in the process of using machine learning. So I want to start, um, I titled this Beyond the Buzz. I wanted to get a little bit of feedback on what are some of the buzz you all have heard about machine learning? And also what questions do you have? So you can either you know, just chat them out or type them in the chat. Nothing. Yeah, I know nothing either. <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> Well, I think um, with all of the information that may be available digitally in computers and other things doing these um, computations beyond my capacity, it seems it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, man, a way to really uh, harness information that probably um, could not have been done uh, in, in the not too distant past. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and so hopefully after this presentation, definitely we'll know more than, you know something. <laughs> and uh, may even realize that you, you knew um, more than you thought you knew. So I'll first go over some of the learning objectives for this discussion. The four. The first two relate to what I'm terming the whys of machine learning. And there, I hope you're able to have a better definition, a better understanding of what machine learning is, and also how it's related to and different from other analysis methods that you may be more familiar with. The second two learning objectives relate to more of the how of actually conducting machine learning analyses. And that's an understanding the two types of choices, the two categories of choices that are made during machine learning analyses. So those relate to the data that you use and the models that you select. So why would you use machine learning? Well, there are two broad categories of questions uh, that you might want to answer using a machine learning method. And those questions relate to either predictions or groupings. So for predictions, here you have questions that you're asking in order to guide specific decisions. And it's a decision where there's some level of uncertainty. I'm giving an example here, given the um, current COVID crisis. So all of my examples kind of tied to that to give some context for um, how machine learning might play a role. So here we have, how do you estimate the number of hospital beds you need? So you could do that using um, sort of a, a intuition, but if you wanna make a more data-driven decision, machine learning uh, methods are one approach to do that. The other category of questions that you can answer using machine learning methods relate to groupings. Here you're identifying uh, similarities in a data set. You can think of identifying clusters or um, factors. It's so the example here um, relates to contact tracing. So you may have heard in the news talking about contact tracing as being a very labor intensive process. We could potentially use machine learning methods um, to infer who you, who your contacts are as opposed to uh, directly observing them. Another way to think about why you might want to use machine learning 
um, is thinking about addressing what's sort of colloquial referred to as the five V's of data. Volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and value. So volume is really the, the aspect where machine learning shines the most. That's where you, you hear the most talk about. Uh, machine learning methods allow you to scale analyses um, to very large, uh, analyzing very large data sets. They also allow you um, to analyze many different types of data, many different structures, whether they be unstructured data, a text, or structured data that can be in more of a spreadsheet format. Machine learning methods also allow you to address data velocity. Here you're thinking about how can we make decisions in real time when uh, you have data streaming, particularly large volumes of data streaming. Machine learning methods allow you um, to analyze those types of uh, data. Veracity and value are related. Here you can think of machine learning methods addressing data veracity and data value in an exploratory way. So maybe you have a data set, but you're not really sure um, if it's valuable for answering the types of questions that you have. Machine learning methods can allow you to uh, efficiently explore that data and um, understand if those uh, data are appropriate um, in terms of the uh, lack of bias and the that sort of addresses your veracity concept. So I've been using this term machine learning. And I'd like to, to take a minute here to actually give a formal definition. So a machine learning method is a decision algorithm where the performance improves as it's exposed to more data over time without being explicitly programmed. It's helpful to think about the term machine learning in a historical context in computer science. Um, before machine learning, if you wanted to write a decision algorithm, you had to explicitly write out if else statements um, and create a decision tree. And that required the programmer to think through every possibility um, for what could influence a decision. With machine learning methods, you're able to develop a decision analysis uh, by learning it from the data instead of having to know in advance what your, your decision model looks like. So that's where this idea of the machine is learning comes from. One of the classic examples illustrating um, these two approaches to developing a decision algorithm um, is understanding whether or not an image contains a cat. And so with the explicit method, you can imagine this uh, figure on the screen. You could perhaps try to describe the length of the tail or whether or not it has ears or the shape of the face. But if you're trying to design an algorithm that can recognize any cat, any image, and any image in any background, that quickly becomes an insurmountable task. However, with a machine learning approach, you can take images of cats and things, images that don't contain cats and label them as whether or not they have a cat. And using a machine learning algorithm, you can actually uh, identify in an automated way the features that uh, distinguish a cat from some other image. So how does machine learning compare to other methods you might be more familiar with? So to give some context to this comparison, think about um, analyses related to a question around understanding if someone's infected. So if you're thinking about a qualitative approach, there you might collect descriptions of experiences of people that have and have not been infected. This would allow you to identify um, potential factors that are uh, 
that people who are affected have uh, particular symptoms. You might then uh, take another step with a statistical approach and build a model at a population level that tells you which of those factors identified in your qualitative analysis uh, are most associated with someone being infected. Machine learning methods allow you to take it one step further and make individualized predictions based on data, a person's data, compared to a model based on uh, population level data. So it's a little bit of comparison. Each of these are critical. Um, and machine learning actually relies on the development of other types of um, models. So it's important to consider it's not necessarily an either or decision, uh, but maybe an and decision when using machine learning methods. So I'm going to switch um, from the whys of machine learning to the hows. The main takeaway from uh, this section is that building a good machine learning model is not um, an automated process, completely automated process, as is sometimes depicted in uh, pop culture. It involves a number of decisions that are made by an analyst. And those decisions relate to the types of data that you use and the models that you select. Another way of saying it is that while the machine may be learning, um, the data scientist is the teacher. So what sort of choices do you make about the data? Well, first, you need to define your problem and the objective, uh, how you're going to identify a solution for that problem. And this needs to be specific enough where you can actually uh, define uh, a model around that problem and objective. It also needs to be specific enough to guide uh, the next step which is identifying re the relevant data that you need. The data, um, as I mentioned earlier, for machine learning methods can be in a variety of formats. They can be structured, they can be unstructured. Um, what's important is that they actually relate to the, the problem that you're trying to answer. A more specific uh, concern is for data that you're trying to use to make predictions These are for the prediction class of machine learning questions. And there, you need what are termed ground truth labels for your data. So if you take our CAD example, if you want to make a machine learning model that predicts if an image contains a cat or not, you not only need many images of cats and images that don't contain cats, those need to be labeled um, with whether or not they contain a cat. Now, this is a fairly simple process when you just have a few cases, but when your examples get into the millions, getting brown truth labels um, can be its own challenge. Once you have the relevant data, then you need to quote unquote clean the data. This is where the bulk of uh, an analyst spends their time. It's estimated that 80% of machine learning analysis um, is spent in this data cleaning process. Here you're addressing sample issues, modifying what are termed predictors. These are the characteristics that are describing your data. You may um, adjust them, uh, the raw predictors that you get from your data set may need to be modified to tune them to your specific problem. Given the uh, continuing with that CAT example, let's say you have predictors uh, that label the color of the CAT or the size of the location, you may need to tune those um, to the type of image that you're, you're trying to analyze. The screening process is also where you address bias. And this is a critical step 
in uh, machine learning analyses. Often, it's actually relatively straightforward to build a simple model, get some data, and make predictions. But if you really want those predictions to be accurate and to not reflect um, a lot of bias, you, you have to think carefully about um, the data set you have and how to structure it in a way that addresses um, biases. Once you have a clean data, data set, you prepare for the modeling step. Now, this is a, uh, an important difference from what might have been done in the statistical analysis. So in a statistical analysis, traditional statistical analysis, the first three steps of defining your problem objective getting relevant data and cleaning that data. Um, those are things that you might also do in a traditional statistical analysis. However, this um, step of preparing for modeling is a little different. And this is different because it's focused on predicting individual cases. And to do that, you need to divide your data into what are termed training, testing and validating uh, data sets. Your training data set you use to build your initial model. You then use your testing data set to uh, check if your model has the predictive performance that you'd like. You can iterate between your training data set where you're modifying the data parameters or labels and your testing data set where you're checking the model performance, predictive performance. And then once you're satisfied with your uh, final model after the last test, then you want to validate it on a new data set um, that has, has not been previously seen by the model. And that allows you to have a robust estimate of how well your model predicts, makes predictions. And this paradigm is a little different from what's typically used in statistical analysis, where you often use your entire data set um, from a given experiment to build your model, and then you repeat an experiment or um, to, to validate your models further. When doing these uh, test, train, validate paradigms, there are actually different ways and more choices that you need to make in terms of how you're training the data, how you're testing the data. Um, there are different options, for example, bootstrapping or leave one out that um, have different pros and cons for how you um, test and train your data. So more choices. Uh, the, the main takeaway here is that there are a lot of decisions that are made as you build these machine learning models. And um, they're often very consequential decisions. So once you have your, your data set ready and you're prepared to model, then you have another choice to make. Which model should you use? As shown in this figure, there are many models to choose from. Um, a broad classification of these models is into supervised and unsupervised models. So this broad classification uh, maps onto those two types of questions that I mentioned earlier. Supervised models tend to be used for prediction uh, analyses, whereas unsupervised models tend to be used for grouping-based analyses. Um, supervised models are also um, the ones that have raised the most interest in popular culture because many of them, the, the more recent ones, are uh, what's termed sort of black boxes meaning that the way in which the model makes the predictions can be very difficult or even impossible to determine. Uh, models in the deep learning category fall into this uh, black box concept. And so that's a decision that you have to make when picking your model. Is it important that your model be interpretable or is it important that your model have the highest possible predictive um, accuracy? Deep learning models often have much higher predictive, but there is a risk that 
um, you don't exactly know what they're basing their prediction on. So I want to conclude just by talking about an um, example. I brought this up earlier. How would you predict uh, hospital capacity? And this is an image from a model that's currently being used from the CHIME project. It's an open source uh, machine learning model that's being used to predict hospital capacity. And one of the interesting things that I saw about this model is that um, in this sort of critical decision-making situation, they didn't use a deep learning or a, some of those more advanced models. They used a, actually a very um, basic model, very uh, interpretable model for these types of predictions. Um, they're actually based on the, what are called SIR models, which is an epidemiological model. What makes this a machine learning application is that you're actually predicting, making predictions about a specific case, and you're learning from data these uh, parameters that you need from your model. And so I'd encourage you, if you're interested, um, the website listed there provides additional details. They actually, um, there's a tool that you can play around with these um, different parameters and see the different predictions for um, when the hospital capacity will be at its peak. Um, and you, can, you can predict how many days out you want to test those predictions. So a very interesting tool. I found it very interesting and um, gives a sense of how machine learning is deployed sort of in the quote unquote real world versus um, what's still in development um, in research and hasn't quite, um, it's not necessarily used for as a, a bread and butter application. So just to review, um, we talked a little bit about the whys of machine learning. What is machine learning? It's a, a decision algorithm that makes predictions uh, and learns from data over time. And it doesn't have to be explicitly programmed. That's what makes it uh, a learning algorithm. Machine learning is uh, related to other more common analyses like qualitative methods and statistical methods, and that it builds on those, um, uses the information from those, mo from those models. Um, however, it is different from them in that it focuses on individual level prediction. In terms of the house of machine learning, we talked about um, that mach building machine learning models is in no way an automated the automated process. There are many choices that an analyst has to make when building these models. And so understanding those choices regarding the data, whether it be um, the getting the appropriate data, defining your problem space, or how you're going to do your chess train paradigm, those are all decisions that you have to make. And then understanding what model you have to make. Is it important for it to be interpretable? or is it important for it to have high predictive accuracy that those types of questions really shape um, the choices you make for the model. So I hope this provided a little bit of information on machine learning and I'll open it up for any questions. Lisa, I thought that was a great overview, particularly grounded it for someone who doesn't have much background. And one of the things that I, I took away from it, um, it really was one of your first slides too, is that in fact, um, and those, those of us who do qualitative research, I think what I took, one of my take home messages is unlike say, a uh, statistical application where you test assumptions for the data and then a statistic is ran, what really impressed me is that, in fact, your, your analyses are actually emerging from the actual data. Um, and I can see why then, you know, there's, there's so much interest as well as 
as you as you mentioned, the fact that a lot of informed decisions need to go into the process. So um, I really that those were really take home messages I got. So I, I, I thank you. That was that was a nice introduction. Thank you for this. Those are definitely the key points uh, that I wanted to get. So I'm glad that that was communicated. No, it was absolutely spectacular, and especially um, how you brought it in relative to right now with COVID and how machine learning is so critical in making some of these predictions and all of the rest. That was really, really well done. Thank you. And I personally love the, idea, the analogy of the cat. because I, I, like <laughs> I noticed there are a lot of cat fans in this group, so I definitely chose the cat. <laughs> This is Ellen. I just uh, I thought that was a fantastic talk, even for someone um, who who does have some background in machine learning, <clears throat> to help people understand what are the challenges of the analyst. Um, I did want to just add one other jargon term that people might hear nowadays. There's this big buzz around explainable AI or explainable artificial intelligence. And that's very related mm -hmm. to this talk, which is that uh, some of the issues that come up with machine learning is that now that you have this nice tool that you built that can classify situations, it's very difficult with some of those methods that Elise presented on that very big chart of the hundreds of <laughs> methods you could use to understand your model. And I will bring that up because that's another place where people who are doing qualitative methods and subject matter experts can help. And I, and I just wanted to bring up one other one, which is sometimes uh, you'll have a machine learning algorithm and you have variables that are correlated and the machine learning algorithm isn't necessarily smart enough to know, you know which one to choose. And so that's another place where the qualitative work would augment the machine learning. For example, you could go to your group of subject matter experts with qualitative methods, perhaps do a, a, a focus group and say, okay, here are our findings. Can you please help us <laughs> understand which variables are the ones that you think are might or might not have the actual explanatory power because the, these tools are are nice in the sense that they give you the results but you you either can't explain them or you don't understand how to deal with uh, choices amongst which are the variables that actually have the the causal meaning as opposed to the um, statistical or algorithmic meaning. Yeah, those are really key points. Um, it's sort of what I was hinting at with the um, comparing the the, the first point of explainable AI. Uh, there, the machine learning methods that get the most press are those black boxes of deep learning, neural networks, um, and those can potentially have very uh, high predictive value, but um, they aren't very explainable. And so uh, that is an open question now of how, how do you figure out um, how to interpret these models? And then the other point of understanding the confounding variables, um, that's why those other methods, um, I really wanted to present them as alongside that when you're thinking about machine learning analyses, you also want to think about the related statistical and qualitative analyses because that's critical for um, helping to inform all of those decisions that you need to make um, in building these models. So very good points. Thank you. Elise, um, so does that suggest if I'm building a model um, I should have some reasoning or rationale for why, um, with the idea then, depending on the analysis, I at least have a basis for um, 
potentially uh, at least understanding how to interpret that versus just something happens and if it explains a lot of, um, it has a good predictive power, I jump on it, but I may not have any understanding of what it means. Yeah, so there's a whole, if you sort of start to dig into the machine learning um, literature, there's a lot of theory around um, what you're describing in terms of feature, it's called feature extraction. And that's how do you um, make decisions, inform decisions about what goes into your model and how much information do you need to know and from a domain perspective versus how much information can you sort of figure out from patterns in the data. And the general consensus is that if you have access to domain uh, information, you will make um, exponentially better models. But these models do provide um, information if you don't know. Um, and that's actually, that was um, my introduction to machine learning methods. It was in an exploratory context where there wasn't really a lot of uh, domain information on the, on the area. There was a lot of data. It wasn't clear if it was useful data. And so the machine learning methods, um, they allowed me to explore um, the patterns in the data, but definitely with those analyses, needing to take them with a grain of salt to say, um, you need to, if you want to make causal statements, you want to uh, do you know, sort of your traditional experiments um, to make those sort of inferences. Mm -hmm. So I think, does that sort of get at what you're, you're asking or, you know? Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. I like when you, your last point really helped me think too, the idea of exploratory versus more confirming. So I, I think that's a really, was for me, it's a useful distinction in terms of different approaches um, based on where where someone where, where our understanding is of a, a certain phenomenon yeah yeah I definitely think in the research context machine learning methods are often used in the exploratory uh, context mm. so you're trying to understand um, sort of in the bioinformatics for example you're trying to understand um, genes and uh, patterns within those materials. So mm. there's domain information relevant, but you're really exploring using machine learning to explore, and um, they help you to get a handle on the volume of data that um, you're having to manage. Yes. Yeah, so hi, Elise. This is Paulina. Really nicely done talk. Um, and uh, just to build on what Bob was asking, as um, say some of the postdocs have um, come across a data set that's helpful in their research, they think might be helpful in their research, and they didn't gather the data, it's someone else's data set. Um, so to explore the data set, say it's electronic health record data or um, type data like that, or as you said, uh, genotype data. Um, to explore the data set, I am assuming because of the work required to uh, clean the data for machine learning, that perhaps the first steps are to use other analytic approaches first to explore the data. Um, and if that's so, at what point do you decide that it's worth the work to use machine learning for the analysis? Yeah, good question. Um, so I just highlighted, um, this is sort of part of my answer, the exploratory methods that um, machine learning methods that are, are tend to be used most in exploratory are um, 
these dimensional reduction methods and clustering methods. Um, depending on how structured your data is, and I'll talk a little bit about what structure means, these can be used um, fairly quickly. So they don't necessarily take a lot of um, the, the cleaning, they can actually be used as part of your cleaning process. So cleaning involves understanding where there's bias in the data, understanding what, you know, differences, if there's subgroups within your sample. And so clustering methods and dimensional reduction methods uh, can actually help with that process. Um, to give a case where that may not be um, true, where you might want to um, take a step back before diving into machine learning methods is with, say, um, unstructured data where you have, uh, for example, text data. So text data often requires a large amount of cleaning um, just to sort of make sense of it in a way and organize it in a way where a machine learning algorithm can use it. The simple things such as misspelled words um, can really throw off a machine learning algorithm. And so there, it's often better to do um, some more qualitative work before um, jumping into a machine learning method. So I would say that the determining factor is how structured the data are. Is that? Um, yes, thank you. Um, and so for the qualitative data, which I think a few postdocs use, would, um, would it be using nat um, natural language processing be one of the methods for cleaning the data or? Um, yes, there are automated uh, processes for natural language um, data cleaning. So mm -hmm. there are um, specialized spell checkers, there are specialized um, sort of workflows to do a text analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so those tools are, are available sort of off the shelf. And it's sort of just a matter of thinking through what is your question that you have that you're trying to answer with the data. And there's, it's a fairly iterative process to think about, um, you know, you have your initial data set, you have maybe your initial question, and as you're cleaning that data set, the questions that you, you have a better sense of what questions you might be able to answer with it. And so um, there are uh, tools, but again, one of the key points of this presentation is that you are really the most important tool. Um, you really have to apply a lot of, there are a lot of choices to make when using any of these tools, even the data cleaning tools. This is Ellen, I was gonna, um... Uh, jump in um, on this particular question is we just published um, a paper a couple months ago in Jamia looking at uh, understand characterizing pediatric asthma. Um, and CHOP has a database of a pediatric data that they've maintained so that researchers can do analyses and just as a a very simple piece. Um, we spent a lot of time in the data cleansing area, as Elise said. Right, actually, once we had the clean data set uh, running an algorithm on it was the really easy part. But to get to um, Paulina's particular question, we you know, had started with the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD codes, we thought that those, you know, would be really easy to use and very straightforward to try to do some diagnosis of this pediatric asthma situation. And we found that 
because those that data set um, had a lot of uh, I, I don't want to say it's inconsistent but it has a lot of overlap different codes have different meanings um, when we when we didn't consider um, when, when we didn't consider using our algorithm and we only said, well, let's see what as pediatric asthma diagnoses we could use with our ICD data set, uh, we could only find 19 of them using the ICD data. But when we used our machine learning algorithm, we found 36 unique diagnoses. Um, and so there was a case where Everyone would say the data set's very well labeled. People have spent you know, lifetimes trying to come up with these nice classifications for EHR data. And yet, you know, we did a, an exploratory study and showed that even using that very well labeled data set, you're going to miss a lot of relationships. And um, I bring this up because this is another nice use of machine learning algorithms is once a group of experts have come up with a particular way to classify data, one could go in with machine learning and see what was missed, are there patterns that are not emerging, and then feed that back to the experts and let them rethink how they want to classify their data. Yeah, and that sort of describes the, um, the, the grouping types of, of analysis. Those are very helpful um, in answering those types of questions. Does that sort of get to your um, question, Paul? Yes, thank you. Okay. So has anyone sort of expired to try out some machine learning methods? <laughs> Well, I'm wondering, thank you for your presentation. I'm wondering what the threshold is for, for looking at um, qualitative work or um, uh, words being a meaning unit and finding an expert to work on a project with you or me. Um, maybe that's not clear, but so if I'm analyzing focus group data I, of like, let's say 10 focus groups, I probably don't meet, need machine learning, but then at what point would I want to look at this further? So maybe if I was analyzing online um, data? Yeah, so, um, so volume is one reason why you might shift to um, machine learning. Uh, or incorporate machine learning. That's sort of, I think, what you're getting at with if you have 10, you just do it by hand, but um, if you have more, you're doing it with machine learning. But that's not necessarily the only reason. I think that's sort of what um, Ellen was, was getting at. Sometimes um, the machine learning methods can be a way to um, not necessarily validate, but sort of compare uh, perspectives on how a human might code data and how an algorithm would code the data. And so you can imagine the, the algorithm certainly will be different and um, may just pick up on different features. And so even with a small data set, it may be valuable to use uh, machine learning um, to just sort of the second part of your question in terms of, uh, can you talk a little bit more about what you meant in terms of partnering and uh, that aspect? Yeah, yeah, I guess just thinking through like project ideas and then when, uh, I guess early on is the best of when you, I, when you would reach out to somebody doing machine learning to see if, if the research question even falls in their field or. Um... Yeah, so one of the interesting things about um, people who are experts in machine learning, they're always looking for data um, because you can't really use the methods without data. And so um, they're often more eager than um, domain experts realize to partner. Um, if there is a data set 
available that they can sort of play around with. The research question is not necessarily the most um, important factor to someone who whose focus is on the machine learning method. It's more the data. So they often specialize um, not by research question or, or research domain, but by uh, data type. So you have people that are experts in text data or experts in um, images or experts in um, sort of a, a traditional rows and columns um, features. So in terms of picking an, an expert, you want to just you can start to reach out as soon as you know the format your data uh, is in. If you know you're going to be working with text data, um, you can reach out to someone who's an expert in that. And it's been my experience, they're often um, excited about talking about new data sets and um, just thinking through different research questions, not necessarily being uh, limited to a particular focus. So. So I hope that gives a little bit, a little bit more information on that question. Yes, thank you. Elise, I know, um, or at least I, if I recall correctly from just some of the informal conversations, um, could you maybe, could you, are, are you able to share a little bit about what you, how might how you're using this um, machine learning and some of the work you're currently doing? Yeah, so um, my experience in machine learning has been with text data, uh, text methods, and also um, predictive methods using features. So, uh, so sort of a rows and columns. So, the plans for the postdoc um, are with using applying those methods to EHR data. So right now, um, Paulina and Ellen and I are doing actually a, more of a qualitative analysis, sort of a niche first cut through EHR data from home care nurses. And there, I'm trying to understand um, how they do medication related activities. So medication reconciliation, education about um, patients' medications risk. And the idea is that if you can better understand that process, you can um, design the EHR uh, to better support documenting that information. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm uh, hand coding the entries into the EHR, but, um, and from that building a model of the types of data that are entered into uh, the current EHRs. But the next step would be to actually use text mining um, and understand from the text mining perspective how to categorize those different types of EHR entries and compare them to um, the hand-built models and understand what are the similarities and differences there and the implications for design. Mm -hmm. So that's um, where I'm incorporating machine learning right now, where I sort of anticipate incorporating it. So it's very much a joint, um, not just a machine learning project, but it's building on other um, qualitative quantitative methods. really interesting are you um where are you in terms of uh the project um just sort of thinking when when will you what and when do you anticipate you actually will have some findings yeah so um actually on the third day of this month um we just got a conference paper uh, reporting the initial hand belt model um, and then writing a journal article using um, cases from multiple home care agencies. Mm -hmm. And so then the, the third analysis would be the machine learning method. So the results of the um, 
the hand-built model I'll have by the end of this month. Mm. So that's sort of the first milestone of that project. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, more questions for Elise? Thank you so much. That was a really informative uh, thing. I, I especially like the uh, model choices. That's, that's kind <laughs> of, the slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of mind blowing about the various different types of uh, uh, models that are that are out there uh, for going through big data sets. It's kind of cool. You're probably uh, looking at decades of PhD theses. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Is, I, I do have one quick question. Is there, is there, uh, Elise, is there one particular, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned it a little bit before saying that you tend to, to go to like the, the, the ones that fall in the clustering and dimensionality uh, reductions. Is that, is that right? Is, when, you, when you're approaching a project, which ones do you tend to go towards more? Yeah, easily? so um, the ones I would use are regression, uh, decision trees for the predictive types of an well regression decision trees and ensemble for the predictive types of analysis so um, and those are the ones that are sort of used in industry not for research research often uses things that are a little more esoteric but those are sort of the bread and butter um, that are used in industry if they're building a very robust model um, they would use either a regression model a decision tree or an ensemble method was just like a, a bigger decision tree. Right. And then if I'm doing unstructured exploratory work, I would use um, the k-means and the clustering. And then for the text mining, I um, use some of the dimensional reduction that LDA, that last one there, that's a text mining uh, method. Got it. So a little more specialized. Cool. Thank you. Um, uh, so if, if nobody has any more questions, I'm going to uh, stop the recording. Um, and then if the postdocs can just hang out for a minute, I just want to uh, uh, ask you a, a couple of quick questions before we, before we end for the day. All right.